We want to have a little conversation today just before uh, we hear a word. Just a short conversation because I think it's good. You know, Jesus, we forget, you know, guys. We forget that actually much of what we know about Jesus, those of you who are more theologically astute will understand this particularly well, that actually we understand much, maybe I'd argue a good 50%, a good 50% of what Jesus taught, we learn not just from what he preached, but from conversations. That the text give us insight and give us an opportunity to eavesdrop into. Of course, his stories, his didactic and teaching narratives, the parables give us insight and revelation, but conversation brings illumination. And so, as we talk today about couples, about marriage, let me sit down a little bit and rest a little while. Um, it's important for us to really pick up, I guess, from yesterday, helping people understand a little bit more about why, why being married is so critical, okay? In a generation that's anti-marriage, in the culture. And when I say anti-marriage, you know, last week I talked about the fact that the Bible talks about there is worldly wisdom, but then there's God's wisdom. The world has their beliefs and ways of doing things, and God has his ways of doing things. So I'm talking about marriage in the biblical sense, in God's originally intended sense. Here's what I would ask you, first of all, Hassani and Daniel. By the way, I want everybody to go check them out on Couples Academy. Those of you who are watching online, just open another tab. Okay, don't, don't tune out of this, but open another tab and go to couplesacademy.org. You can download a load of stuff there, find out more about them. These two individuals, if you didn't know already, uh, most of the church is familiar with them, are like the paramedics for uh, marriages that are in trouble, but they also do things to help vaccinate marriages from getting into trouble. Uh, Couples Academy does amazing, amazing work. Uh, dealing with a lot of uh, high net worth individuals, sports stars in America, uh, actors, actresses, etc. But hey, let's talk. Why does marriage still matter? That's what I'd open with. Well, marriage simply matters because it's God's plan for our life. I think that unfortunately there's too many believers that have allowed the culture of the world to influence how we do relationships. And so when you pay attention to social media, when you listen to the pundits, when you listen to this new modern way of relationships, they will, con they will actually teach you that marriage and family is not significant, it's an old concept, it's traditional, and we're in a more new way of, of doing life. But we know that God's first in institution on this earth was marriage. It's the foundation of all civilization. So if we are truly going to walk in what God has called us to do, we have to honor marriage because from that marriage, all things come marriage, family, community, civilization, and everything else. Yeah, I, I co-sign that, and I would just say that, you know, Satan knows that if he obliterates the family or the marriage, he obliterates the family. Mm. And this is why we have an attack right now. We have confusion in the world because people have lost sight of God's original plan. It was Adam and Eve in the garden, and it was for us to establish his kingdom here on earth. Well, now we're confused about gender and all kinds of things, and so we're seeing that anarchy is spinning loose in the world because we don't have families. How long you been married? We've been married for 21 years. Hey! Woo! Almost 22. Almost 22. So Pastor Donna and I are 22 years in. She said 23 yesterday. Is that how long it feels? <laughs> <laughs> so, so in terms of what you're experiencing, as you're traveling around the world, you guys get, they get flown all over the world to do private sessions, emergency sessions with couples that are in trouble uh, and um, also facilitating workshops and seminars, all kinds of coaching that you do concerning marriages. What, is, what are some of the major issues you're seeing pop up within marriages that should have been addressed before people got married? Yeah, you know, I think the top five struggles that most couples have in their relationships would be sex, finances, parenting, in-laws, and communication. Let's start with sex. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> Real quick, because we, I've got lots of single people yes. who think that marriage will always satisfy sometimes, sometimes deviant sexual desire that's been corrupted by the way we operate mm. in this world. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, who you are before I say I yeah. do yeah. is who you're going to be after you say I do. You don't go through a metamorphosis or a transformation simply Can you say that you... one more time for the people at the back? 
You do not go through a transformation simply because you say, I do. There's got to be a cleansing of your heart and your mind. That's why the Bible says that we must be renewed in our minds. A renewed mind leads to a transformed life. And oftentimes, even in our marriage, we bring in the culture of the world. We bring in a single mindset. We bring in these deviant beliefs because we've been soaked and saturated into a way of thinking and believing and functioning in a relationship. And that's why oftentimes we pervert our marriages because we haven't gone through a personal transformation. Danielle. Thank you, Hassani. Daniel. Hassani just said pervert our marriages. For me, and I deal with women mostly, um, the perversion of marriage and sex in the bedroom has been huge because we're coming out of the world having had sex, having perceived sex a certain kind of way, doing things based on the world's way, and then we want to bring that same energy into the bedroom, and it is a, it's a conflict, right? And so really it's about couples coming together and deciding what we're going to do in our new God-fulfilled kingdom marriage as opposed to bringing the world into a kingdom marriage. So give us that list. That list was... Oh, sex... sex. Uh, parenting, in-laws, finances, and communication. So pre-marriage, yeah. all my singles, when they're dating for data, this is the kind of stuff they need to be finding out, people's perception. Going back to what I, we were teaching about and talking about last week, when we're going out trying to find the right person, what's the information we're trying to glean? Well, see, first of all, we have to understand that there are four seasons to a successful relationship. Come on, tell it. You have your dating season, which is the selection process. Then you have the committed courtship, which is the getting to know you phase. That's the time when you want to have these conversations. Then you have engagement, which is your season of preparation. And the number four, you have marriage, which is the final frontier. Each season comes with a different level of commitment, a higher level of expectations, and there should be a deeper dive in terms of understanding who that person is so that you're walking in with your eyes wide open as opposed to you know, wide shut. And the reality is we think because we have a feeling called love that love is enough. But people get married every day because they love each other. But people who divorce, they still love each other, but they realize that love was not enough. It takes other things. And so that's why premarital counseling is critically important before you say I do. So you understand how to overcome these challenges that most couples struggle with. I love it. Are there any particular areas that affect, let me get a little deeper, because I know Hassani has written some phenomenal books, and um, some of them are very culturally specific, okay? Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> are there any things that you're seeing that tend to resonate with particular cultures, ethnicities, when it comes to issues that pop up? And I raise that, as you can hear, I'm probably making a little bit of a, a statement in disguise okay because oftentimes the conversations that arise concerning masculine energy oh, yeah. are often associated with particular cultures whether it's true or not mm. um, by the way <laughs> uh, <laughs> by the way when, when we first met okay years ago and you guys were talking we were talking having a conversation about masculine energy feminine energy uh, about feeling emasculated would you tell Daniel just, just tell us how you responded to Hassani when he f was saying he was feeling that you were emasculating him in the, in the marriage. Go on. So, I, I mean, I feel like I need to give a teeny tiny bit of background yes. because, you know, we're about to talk about this, you know, female masculinity that has been placed on us innocent black women. But we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> you, you said it. I'm, I just let in. You know? But, you know, we were, we were in a heated argument, and Hassani was talking about how, you know, some of the things that I wasn't doing and how I wasn't showing up in a wife, as a wife. And at that time, we were in a very bad place. And just as he was feeling emasculated, I was feeling defeminized. And in the midst of an argument, I screamed at the top of my lungs that he declitorized me. So that is something, let that resonate with you because there is a defeminization in our character and in our behavior that has taken place over time for reasons. And Hassani wrote a masterful book on it, which he's gonna talk about. 
Yeah, I, I wrote a few books. Um, I was an African American studies major in the United States at Rutgers University. So I wrote a book called Black Thighs, Black Guys and Bedroom Lies. I wrote a book called Why We Hate Black Women and Why We Should Love Them. And so to kind of answer your question, you know, we travel all over the world and deal with cultures everywhere. And there are certain similarities, certain things that you'll find consistent. But in terms of the, the African or the African American experience, there is this power struggle that exists amongst our people. And it goes all the way back to the plantation or wherever we may be in the diaspora. And, and, and this power struggle of masculinity and femininity has caused issues. You know, particularly in the States, there, there was a time when we had nothing but pretty women and working men. But it seems like today we have a whole lot of pretty men and working women. We switch roles, right? And, and that role reversal has impacted how we- You can't say we, that that fast. You, you got, I said that too fast. You said that too, the people at the back need to hear, okay? I said there was a time when we had nothing but pretty women and working men. Uh, but now it seems like today, in many respects, there's a whole lot of pretty men and working women, right? And so there's a lot of, and listen, that's just one component, right? The impact of finances and career and advancement does impact the marriage in a particular way, but also when dealing with gender identity and what roles should look like, there's been this power struggle. And so we find that there are many women who are more masculine and many men who are more effeminate. And I don't mean feminine in a, in, in a sexual type of way, but yeah. in a posture and in an energy and a way that they lead out the family. And in terms of the seven things that you listed as things constantly popping up, out of those things, which is the greatest? I think of all those things that I mentioned, without a shadow of a doubt, our inability to effectively communicate is the biggest challenge of them all. Yes. Naturally, people, people, well, let's say naturally, probably incorrectly, but it's oftentimes associated with men. Men don't communicate. Talk to us about the differences. Well, I think, first of all, your ability to articulate words does not make you a good communicator. Just because you can out-talk, out-wit, out-think that man doesn't mean that you're a better communicator. Right. We do gender-wise communicate differently. Yes, yes. A lot of men speak the language of action, so we're doers, so we demonstrate. Women speak the language of emotion, so they articulate. And so we're speaking two different dialects. But also, you know, men speak in bullet points, women speak in paragraphs, right? <laughs> and so that creates a challenge. Let the church say amen. Come on. <laughs> And so, you know, Danielle talks about the personalities and how that influences communication. But I think at the end of the day, we have to learn how to become bilingual. Our ability to become bilingual allows us to begin to have breakthrough in the way that we do communicate. Danielle, my wife and I, one of the problems that we still have every now and again is timing. So, like, I'm ready to sleep. I'm in the bed. I'm, I'm, I've hit the pillow. It's been a long day. And she, she will be like, right, what it is? And I'm like... I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I can't say it because she's not on stage with me and I've got a microphone so I'm louder than her today. But um, uh, <laughs> timing is a big issue for us as men. I don't know if she's doing it strategically because she knows I'm sleepy so I'll just agree to anything. Talk to us a little bit more about that communication yeah. aspect. Uh, there are gender differences, right? But there is this overarching personality thing that we have to acknowledge and we have to deal with, right? So that kind of balances the scales. So what you're saying is the same dynamic Hassani and I have, but we're different. Hassani's more of a communicator. I'm more of a thinker. So in the mornings, Hassani's ready to go. He is talking. He's got bullet points. He's like, what are we doing? Da, 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 da. And I have not arrived yet. I'm still in between heaven realm, dream realm. I'm not there. And so we have established rules. So Hassani knows that if I'm not talking in the morning, I'm still asleep. <laughs> so we've, we've set boundaries for that because it really does matter. And when it comes to the different nuances in the marriage, really learning how to recognize our differences and honoring and respecting that, it just causes the intimacy to bloom and you connect and you stop feeling so offended and annoyed by those little habits that are inconsistent. Yeah. yeah. We, we believe that, I mean, if you think about it like this, when nations go to war, right, enemies go to war. Interestingly enough, they can kill, murder, and maim, but they also have to honor certain rules of engagement. Rules of engagement. If they don't honor those rules of engagement, they can be tr tried as war criminals, be sentenced to prison, or even death. 
And so if enemies can operate with certain rules of how to engage with one another, doesn't it make sense that couples establish rules of engagement for what makes for effective communication? And your ability to honor those rules will really create breakthrough in whatever the struggle is that you're facing. I love it. I love it. Come on, put your hands together for that. I want to go back a little bit real quickly to this because it's a big topic. I've been pastoring for 26-ish years. And this one constantly comes up about this, this energy difference, okay? You wrote the book, and I think some of the statistics you mentioned in that book are really fascinating. Some of them are slightly depressing, to be honest. But, you know, it's truth, nonetheless, because I know you did your statistical research. Um, the book's called Why We Hate Black Women and Why We Should Love Them because of many of the stereotypes placed on them. But talk to us a little bit more. You said that you felt declitterized because he was feeling emasculated. How did you work that out? How, how, because there's couples in here, in this room. There are couples, zoom in cameraman, online. Okay. I think it's important to talk about what declitterization feels like emotionally, because we know that that's a real thing, right? Um, do you know, do, do many women, though, sorry to cut you, mm -hmm. but the problem is, do many women know what emasculation feels like? When a man feels emasculated, some, it's a phrase we, we cart around, but what, does it, what did it feel like between the two of you, and how yeah. did you guys work it out? Well, when, when, she, when she first said that, like, you declitterized me, I didn't understand what she meant, but in essence, what she was saying that I robbed her of her femininity, and I robbed her of her womanness, right? So I stripped down the core essence of who she was and made her feel lesser than what God created her to be. And I think for emasculation, it's the same thing. You know, there are what we call uh, makers of men and breakers of men. Right. Women who know how to speak life into that man, but then others who speak to the weeds surrounding that man right. and will speak death. And so there's so many men who are walking around impotent today, not because there's anything physically wrong, but in their heart, in their mind, in their spirit, they're so broken and can't show up the right way because of the way that we treat each other, talk to each other, engage with each other. And I think that uh, rather than realizing that we're on the same team, we become arch enemies uh, in conflict one another, with one another and don't seem to get any type of resolution. Danielle. I, I just think that there are some women that are makers of men and there are some that are breakers of men. And we've learned that over time. We've learned it from our mother. We've learned it from our grandmother to tear a man down. We haven't learned how to build them up. And so as we can tear our men down and de emasculate them, they can do the same to us by tearing us down, telling us what we're not, breaking our spirit. And so what happens when a woman becomes emotionally declitterized is that her body dries up. She is unable to perform emotionally, physically, sexually. And so that's what the declitterization was about because I could still do the things, I, I could still cook, I could still take care of the kids, I could still be nice to him, but sexually, I was dry. Dry. <laughs> so, so you said how, how do we overcome it? <laughs> I'm just saying. We, this is the Tap Church we, London. We, we look at your neighbor and say, this is the Tap Church London. We Sunday. talk about stuff like this, okay? On Sunday. On a Sunday, on okay? On a Sunday. I warned them. I sent a warning video out. I said, don't come to church today. People who, so we suffered everything. Like all those five things I mentioned, we suffered it all. But how do we make our way out? I think the pro at first, to be honest, I wasn't interested in counseling. I wasn't interested in getting help. And that's a typical male oh, response. Yes. Men, we yes. don't, we're, like, we're not going nowhere. We're not talking to yes. no one. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't interested. I didn't want no other man telling me how to run my household. I certainly didn't want to go to the pastor because everybody in the church knew us. I didn't want him preaching our life from the pulpit. I was just resistant <laughs> to all of it. But, but when we got to the point of no return, I remember her saying, you know what, Hassani, you do you, and I'm going to do me. And when she said that, I kind of knew what that meant. And I said, if I don't do something now, because I was about to lose her. She was, and that's the thing, like 98% of men who reach out to us, reach out to us either A, when their wife is already out the door and she's left and he's trying to get her back, or she's one foot out the door and he's trying to save her. So a lot of times, bad behavior takes place in the marriage as long as we have this idea, they ain't going nowhere. Nothing going to change. They're going to be right here. And that justifies the bad behavior. And that ends up you guys just living as roommates. Oh, man. 
just just yeah, it's yeah. just existing in the relationship. Yeah. Roommates. I know I say it all the time. Yeah. But 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 I talk about how couples go from being soulmates to roommates to roommates. Break, break that down for the people. Well, on, soulmates. Down. When you first come together, you're in love with each other. There's this <coughs> amazing connection. You can't you know, wait to spend time with each other. You're connected, heart, body, and soul, everything. Then what happens is once you say I do, the atmosphere of the relationship shifts and changes. Yeah. It's about duties and responsibilities and obligations. So now you're fulfilling a role and a duty. And so now it's about the kids and work and finances. So you take off your husband and wife hat and you put on your mommy and daddy hat. It's a role. And so because of that emotional disconnect, if you don't get it back, you now begin to transition into roommates where there's just no connection. You're just two ships passing in the middle of the night. And so you have fights that you don't overcome, issues that get unresolved. And then before you know it, you transition into being cellmates where you feel trapped in a marital prison because you're in constant conflict. And at that point, you're ready to throw in the towel, call it quits, and just give up. And so what we've been through those stages, and the couples we work with have been through those stages because they're guilty of doing marriage wrong. And we have figured out a way to do it right. And that's what we tell other couples, how to do marriage right, to get back from being cellmates to becoming soulmates. And I love that because, I mean, we talk about that here a lot of the time with our relationship. It's about cellmates, people feeling trapped, people feel in prison, but actually seeing the progression, hearing it put the way you've put it, the progression of going from soulmates mm. to just r role mates, mm -hmm. yeah. to then just roommates, mm -hmm. and that dangerous zone. There's somebody, who's, I believe, who's heard that today. They're in a marriage, they're watching us online, and you've probably saved some people right there because they're able to see where things progress to in terms of the negativity. One, one more question I'd probably ask you, maybe one, one or two more, I guess, before we, we go forward. Um, in terms of men, I noticed you just said when men, 98% of the men who reach out to you, I'm, I was quite surprised by that. Is there a high stat then of men who reach out for help? Because it tends to seem to be in a marriage, if there is a problem in a marriage, by the way, guys, not every marriage is in a problem. But what we're talking about here is how to rescue marriages from getting deeper into problems. It tends to mainly be the women who reach out. Right. Generally speaking, the woman does reach out. Um, I think, you know, interestingly, 70 percent of all women over 40, 70 percent of all divorces are initiated by women. 70 percent of 70%. divorces are initiated by, by women. women. Right. Because they get fed up very early in the relationship because what they signed up for is, is, is not what they're experiencing. Um, but yes, um, when men do reach out, it's really it's almost at the point of no return. I think it's important to note that there's this idea that typically men are the ones who cheat in the relationship and women somehow are morally, biologically more superior or refined. And that's not the case at all. There's a high percentage of women who are betraying marriages at all and the th as well. And the thought and belief is that if a man gets cheated on, there's no way in the world that he's gonna stay. And that is a lie from the pit of hell because men want their wives, they want their marriages, they want their families, and they're willing to go through a process as well to get them to the place where they're now whole and healed. Now, Danielle, you and Hassani are, are practitioners in coaching, relationships, in particular, obviously, marriages, but one of the niches, one of the, um, I know you guys say niches, but um, one of the niches is, is infidelity recovery. So while we're on that topic there, People tend to think that if, if there has been a break in the marriage, that it's definitely over. Talk to us about your experiences having coached couples through that, success rates, etc. My specialty is working with the women <clears throat> because um, a while back we discovered that there was an issue. Even though the women were moving along the process, whether they were the unfaithful or whether they were the faithful, didn't matter. They were going through the motions and doing the things, but they weren't healing internally. They weren't feeling it. Um, and so there was a, a divide, an emotional break for the women. And so I have developed a program, it's called Unearth, to kind of dig them out of the rubble of infidelity. Because when a crisis like that hits your marriage, it's like a bomb blows up. You don't know where all the places and pieces of you went. And so that's been the biggest issue for me working with the women and helping them to kind of put themselves back together in the process of doing the things that they have to do to restore the marriage. Because the things that you have to do to restore the marriage don't necessarily feel good or feel right, but are right. And so those that have the heart to do the hard work 
needed a little extra push to heal the heart in the process. So that's what we do on my end. Yeah, and so. what a great work it is. Um, we have a team of practitioners and some of them specialize in working with men, but I really focus on the couple. Like, so I'm the infidelity recovery specialist and we take couples through a three-prong approach where we focus on their marital recovery, yeah. their individual recovery, as well as the affair recovery. And in that process, there is a very specific, methodical, six-step process that allows them to find individual healing and their relational restoration. So by the time they get through our three-day intensive and the aftercare programs, they find themselves to be in a better place. And many of them say, man, uh, our, our belief is that if you give us one year of your marriage, you will no longer recognize it. And there are many people who have said, man, I don't know, I don't even recognize anymore. Like, what did you do to my husband? And what did you do to my wife? And I think it speaks to the work, because you got to put in that work. Yeah. yeah. It's so critically important. And when you do that, you see transformation. Thank you both so much. We are believers here in watering your marriage, doing the weeding, if you want a beautiful garden, you've got to do the work. And um, we've got people like you guys out there doing great ministry work. We celebrate you. Hassani, I know you travel a lot doing a lot of this stuff. And we need more people like you guys. So we celebrate all that God is using you to do. We love you. And you've got the Tab Church London's got your back. Thank you so much. We love you back.